You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. I'm Mark Golub, and what better way to begin January in the new year, the new decade, than to sit with the Executive Vice Chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations and the gentleman who really is at the center of so much that goes on, not only on the American Jewish scene, but on the world Jewish scene, Malcolm Honline. First of all, Happy New Year to you. Happy Secular New Year. And thank you to so you much too. again for letting us come in and, and probe you and talk to you and ask you for Always your my perspective. Pleasure. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, I want to begin by getting something out of the way. There have been reports in the secular and Anglo-Jewish papers that you visited Syria personally, not, I understand, as a representative of the State of Israel, but as a member here of the American Jewish community, almost as an individual. And you have said publicly on a number of occasions, you don't want to comment or discuss it. I just want you to explain to our audience why you feel it's so important that at the moment, you hold off on the discussion of Syria. Okay, so you want to me to talk about what I won't talk about. <laughs> okay, very clever. <laughs> uh, look, uh, look, I understand everybody's interested in it. I would be interested as well, and I am interested. In, but I won't even tell me what I talked about. Uh, I had the opportunity. This is not something that suddenly arose. Um, I, I, I went there not as a representative or a messenger or a mediator or a negotiator. I went in my personal capacity. It was a personal invitation. I did have the opportunity to meet with President Assad and others. I was there a very short while. Um, but one of the understandings was that I would not discuss what we discussed because if, in fact, I want to accomplish certain things, then the confidentiality is essential. And it's essential to have a relationship of trust. Too often, when it comes to these kind of issues, people rush to the press you know, the instant gratification is great, but you have to look at the long-term interest. And as in many other things I've been involved with, which thank God have not become public, it is regrettable that someone felt it necessary to write about this. They didn't, most of what's been written is not true. And, uh, and, and there is no one, literally no one who knows what happened in the meeting, uh, except for the president and myself, because we met alone, so that people who are speculating about what was said or wasn't said it's speculation. I have pursued humanitarian interests of the Jewish people for almost four decades now. I, God willing, will continue to do it. And when we've done it, I've largely done quietly, and that made it effective. I can only say this, no one does it better than you, and if at any time it is appropriate to discuss it, then we will. Till then, I appreciate what you're saying, and now we'll leave that alone. So we begin 2011. If I said to you, give me Malcolm Honline's sort of State of the Union perspective of the Jewish community in America and the Jewish world, what at the moment concerns you the most as we begin this new year? Well, first of all, I think we're in a period of flux. I think there are so many factors now at play where you can't necessarily pin it down and say, this is what's going to happen in the coming year on vital issues like Iran. No one can predict what this year will bring on Iran from their capitulating to the sanctions to everything else and increasing sanctions and other steps that might be taken to perhaps some sort of a, of a more extreme action having to be necessary. Is Iran your number one concern? Iran, I think, is the number one global issue it's, it is not a Jewish concern. It's not an Israel concern anymore. I think people have become educated to the fact that given their activities around the world, in South America, Africa, Europe, everywhere, uh, their linkages to North Korea, to, 
to um, Libya, to other countries, the growing hegemony that they are exercising through Iraq and in Iraq, and I think that could be a big story of the coming year, is the future course of Iraq becoming a satellite of Iran. The Maliki government is not one that many of the other Arab countries uh, wanted to see, and Assad is not the only Arab leader I speak to. I speak to many, and uh, I know that they're, they're deeply concerned about that course. Um, it just it does change the Eastern Front if you, you introduce the instability, or if it leans, Iraq starts to lean the wrong way, as we have seen evidence already. Uh, so Iran has great influence there, obviously in Syria, in Lebanon, in Hezbollah, and the visit this year, this past year to Lebanon, in Gaza through uh, Hamas. Uh, so they're achieving a lot of what he says. So I think people have come to recognize, and that's why the WikiLeaks stories were not surprising, that Arab leaders mm -hmm. describe Iran as the major danger. The second thing is what will happen on the Palestinian-Israeli course. Will, will the Palestinians continue to pursue unilateralism at the UN? And uh, we've seen the first steps in the South American countries recognizing a Palestinian state. This will not stop there. Uh, it's a mistake. It's counterproductive. The United States has come out strongly against it. Uh, they may push for a resolution on settlements in the Security Council, either to force a U.S. veto or perhaps to try and water it down to get the U.S. to abstain. The U.S. has said that this is not the right approach and that they would veto. I hope that will continue to be the policy. They can go to the General Assembly where you have an automatic majority. And Iran, by the way, will become the chair of the non-aligned movement this year, which gives us great hope that we'll have a fair shot there ever. Um, so the co course of that obviously is important. And how much does that frighten you or worry you? about the direction of the Palestinian-Israeli yes. talks. I, th I think it's very important uh, because you have a partner who's proven uh, that they do not want to negotiate, but this more and more puts Israel in the defensive position that they keep putting the onus on Israel when, in fact, the onus rests on the Palestinians. We had some false starts over the past year. This thing about the freeze, I think, was a mistake. It was a mistake for the president uh, to initially put the emphasis on the settlements and the freeze and settlements, which Abbas himself said this year put him in the position of, being, of, of not being able to demand less, even though he never demanded it before. But more than that, if you look at the policies that they're adopting, the Fatah Revolutionary Council, uh, the statements of Abbas, no negotiations on refugees, no land swaps, I mean, everything that would undermine the chance of negotiations working, the continued incitement, all of the other uh, factors that are, are, are at play. And instability in the region, a lack of resolution, or if the door appears to be closing to negotiations, I think that will be very serious. So it is important that there be some process. I think the Europeans, the Russians now are talking about jumping in. I think that that would not be helpful. Um, the United States is the sole country that can play, I think, a constructive role here. I think Netanyahu was prepared to go very far, and it was not he who rejected the settlement freeze. The United States dropped it when they saw that they can't, couldn't get anything from the other side in response. There are some who now feel that the largest stumbling block preventing some kind of movement on the peace initiative is the matter of Jerusalem. First of all, to what extent do you agree? And second, what do you think now the appropriate Israeli and world Jewish position should be on Jerusalem? I'm talking now about in some way does a Palestinian state, if a two-state solution were to be implemented, should any part of East Jerusalem be ceded to the Palestinian state? Look, it is a very sensitive issue. Uh, I take a very strong position on this issue. I'm, I'm not a compromiser when it comes to Jerusalem. And I, uh, I believe that Jerusalem must remain united. Uh, I do think that there are solutions that have been proposed that might be able to work to satisfy different needs, but I think clearly dividing Jerusalem, putting the holy place under international control, all of these proposals will not work. Um, I think any restrictions on the right of Jews to be able to explore our past would be a violation that would impact generations to come, because look at all the discoveries that are being made every day, bringing the whole Bible to life. I mean, just 
unbelievable. It's, we could spend the next, this show and the next 12 shows just discussing just what happened in the past year, all of the discoveries at the City of David, at the tunnels, everywhere, every shovel going in the ground for the New Light Railroad, uncovering our past, finding where David fought Goliath, finding the coins that were dumped by Arafat from the Temple Mount that had the name Elijah with the burn marks from the time of the, of the destruction of the Temple when they opened the Temple Mount, uh, the oh, Palestinians. It's very exciting, is it? It's incredibly exciting. It's more than exciting. But I think it's a reminder to us that we look to our past to understand our responsibility to the future. So when it comes to Jerusalem, I believe it's the one issue in which Jews in the diaspora and everywhere have a right to have a say, not to make the decisions. That's the government of Israel. But generally on defense and security issues, I believe it's the people and government of Israel. Others have a right to responsibly express their views. Jerusalem, I think, is different. I think it's a different status. I think it has uh, what uh, Abu Mazen has repeatedly said, that he can't make a decision on Jerusalem because it's a decision of the Muslim people. Well, I think for the prime minister, it's also a decision of the Jewish people worldwide. Ultimately, the decision will rest with them to make it. But in terms of input and in terms of the sentiment and, and the connection, I think Jerusalem is different. Malcolm, but, what is a resolution that you see as possible? Well, I don't want to, I'm, I'm not the guy who will draw the boundaries. I have, I have uh, some ideas of my own, but, you know, there are areas that they consider part of Jerusalem that we don't. There are areas that were part of greater Jerusalem uh, that could be a symbolic presence. I mean, there are things that have been proposed in the past. Uh, it's not useful for us because okay. I'm not Do a negotiator. Do you believe any, anything Israel offers will be acceptable, no. would be acceptable? No. You understand that that makes Ultimately. this, uh, this, that makes because this. Because they're not interested in negotiations. That's exactly the point. And you're, you're, you're coming to the crux of the issue. That no matter what, Israel offered, Olmert offered 99%, Barak 95%. I mean, Camp David, you had it repeatedly. It was Arafat, it's Abu Mazen. They don't want to negotiate. They want to force the international community to force Israel to give it to them on a silver platter so they don't have to make concessions. When he said no concessions on the, on the re return of refugees, everybody agrees that that's not that's a non-starter, that, that kills negotiations. You can have the government of merits and they, they will tell you clearly that it's, it's non-starter. Even the settlement issues, all the settlements represent 5% of the territory of the West Bank. There, have been, there were five new settlements built between 1990 and 1999, none since. There were no new settlements built. Even construction in these big communities of 30, 40,000 people had a couple hundred per, uh, permits to, for construction of apartments. It's minuscule. This is not the obstacle to peace. The fact that the Palestinians are building 10 times that amount in the same area, even in Jerusalem and in building illegally in Jerusalem, nobody contends that that is an obstacle to peace, that that is a violation. But if Israel tries to build a few houses, expand, it, puts a kindergarten, a synagogue, uh, a bathroom onto somebody's home, all of a sudden that's the obstacle. And people have this image that somehow the settlements are eating up the West Bank area. It's altogether 5%. Now, when you're talking about the land swap, where, where the vast majority of the people are located, it's a small area around Jerusalem. And they said, we will compensate with other territories, even territories if they want, you know, people have proposed the Palestinian areas or others where there's population, if that's what they want. The people living there don't want to go because they don't want to live under Palestinian authority. They, they criticize Israel and they knock Israel all the time, but they sure as heck don't want to live under that. So. I think that, that you know, we create issues and make obstacles out of, out of them, which become an excuse. On the other hand, Jerusalem can become, you know, when they say they have to leave it for the final discussion, I think it's a mistake because then you're going to have all of the talks, everything will build up, and they'll say, only for Jerusalem are you going to sacrifice it? I agree 100% with you. Does anything at all give you hope that a two-state solution could be move towards, I don't want to even say uh, accomplished, but move towards during 2011? Well, I think developments on the ground give us some hope. You see the, the improving economy, the security cooperation, Israel has removed the roadblocks. Israel has made many concessions the past year, including release of refugees, of, uh, of terrorist prisoners and others. Um, there are many I things that have happened. There is greater cooperation on the ground. You see the institutions that Fayyad is supposedly creating, even though there are many who now say they're becoming as corrupt as they were before. Um, but one thing you don't see is that they're not preparing the people for a two-state solution. We hear now them proposing a one-state solution. You hear more talk of a one-state solution. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a Jewish state. That would be disastrous. Uh, and of course, and it's, it's not going to happen, and, and, and it means the end of Israel. So 
uh, if I would see really serious efforts on the issues of incitement, and I've talked to uh, Abu Mazen, President Abu Mazen, about it, and part he acknowledged, he said, well, they've taken some steps, but overall, you have ministers of the government saying these outrageous things, keep on honoring those who murder Jews. I mean, how are you sending a message to your people that you really want to live in peace and prepare them for uh, a peaceful uh, arrangement? And the polls reflect the fact that uh, they still support continued violence, et cetera. And I'm not saying the situation is ideal. It's not. And there are problems. And, you know, as long as uh, we have these areas of tension, and claims and counterclaims, there also has to be a commitment on their part that this is the end of claims, that once you reach an agreement, it's not a stepping stone towards the next thing. And that's what Netanyahu has demanded. Yes. And, in fact, it's not a new demand. It's one that has been there all the time. And yet you don't hear that readiness to make a commitment even as fundamental as that. So those are things that mitigate although I think there are developments on the ground, and I think Netanyahu's commitment is sincere. I've talked to him about it. I think he really would like to reach an agreement. He said that he's ready to sit in a room and not leave until they reach an accord. Uh, he said it again just recently, and, uh, and I believe he really does want to do it. I think he, he, he sees it as one of the priorities that he established and wants to, to fulfill. In part, it's related to Iran, because you know Iran poses a, a regional danger and having the more issues you resolve, but not because solving the Arab-Israeli issue solves the Iranian mm -hmm. issue. And frankly, if we solved Iran, believe me, you could solve all the other issues readily. You have been talking to us about Fayyad for many years. I hear conflicting things about him. I want to know where you stand at the moment. Is Fayyad a legitimate moderate or not? Uh, President Bush was the first who told me to go and see him and said, look, this, he's different than the others and you have to talk to him. And the fact is that he talked, uh, he fought corruption. He doesn't enjoy broad political support. Uh, there are many in Fatah who fear that he wants to run for president and that would divide. Uh, he did take steps to end the corruption, although I've heard more recently that a lot of that has returned, you know, with the payoffs for licenses and everything else. Maybe not his doing or his approval, but the, the clean uh, sweep is not, doesn't appear to be so clean. Um, w I'm not sure anymore where he is. I know that some of his statements and the fact that he himself went to declare people shaheeds and martyrs after killing Jews uh, really uh, disturbed me greatly and, and undermined my earlier assessment of him. When he was here with Dani Ayalon and walked out of the UN press conference, because Ayalon wanted him to sign a document that said there would be two states for two peoples. Didn't mention Jews, but there would be two states for two peoples. When he walked out on that, Ayalon and people who share Ayalon's view say that it is a mistake to sort of paint him with as moderate a brush as many in the American Jewish community and the world Jewish community wanted to do so. Is there any validity to that? Well, I'd say that there are a lot of questions that have arisen that uh, have not been satisfactorily answered. Uh, he addressed the President's conference when we were in Janine last year. He came and Did asked himself. Did he impress himself, you then? Uh, well, he addressed some of the issues uh, forthrightly. He did not address some of the other issues that we presented him with, like the declaring of Shahids, like these other things. He was evasive. He would not answer it. and. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to create leadership that is going to fit the mold we want. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we can't just excuse away the consistent behavior, the refusal to confront terrorism in, in word and in deed, the uh, continuing honoring of, of martyrs and extolling those who kill Israelis, and, uh, and not really being committed to the negotiating process. It's not his choice. This is not where Fayyad can be held to account. This is Abu Mazen's. He said, I am going to build the institutions. He didn't say I'll declare a state. He said, I'll build the institution of state, which Israel has tried to help him with. And in that regard, I think it, it, it was constructive. And mention also Hebron for me, because when I speak to many in the Jewish community, there is a reminder all the time that Hebron is the second most historically important city to the Jewish people. And proceeded Jerusalem. And on the one hand, we hear that any peace negotiation with the Palestinians, from their perspective, requires the presence of 
Arab Israelis and even Palestinians inside Israel. But there seems to be no reciprocity in that area. That in some way, um, Abbas Abu Mazen has even said, even if there's a security force, uh, a NATO security force uh, stationed on the West Bank, no Jews may be part of that force, no Jews may live on the West Bank, and there are many in the Jewish community who feel that Hebron is a place that somehow there should be a compromise worked out. I'm just curious whether Hebron at all is of significance to you. It's of great significance, and especially you have Marat HaMachpelah, the burial ground of our forefathers and foremothers. There's certainly a long history there. Um, it doesn't get much discussion now, but I think that, again, if there's a willingness to make, a desire to make peace, they can find constructive arrangements for all of these problems. If that's not the intent, then all of these things will be major mm -hmm. obstacles. And I think you've touched on an important point that, that people are reluctant to discuss, and that is the idea that if you sell land to a Jew, to an Israeli, you face a death penalty in Jordan, but in the West Bank as well. When they talk about, when an Israeli rabbi makes, a, I think, an offensive statement about not renting and not selling and, and to, to Arabs, the whole world is up in arms. But here, the head of the Palestinian Authority can, can state blatantly, first there will be no Jews, then later he realized, he was told that that's not politically correct, so he said no Israelis, but he meant no Jews. Um, and that uh, not one Israeli can remain, not in a military sense, but can't live on, on, te on that territory. Even under Palestinian sovereignty. I'm talking about under Palestinian yes. sovereignty, exactly. So, you know, <laughs> there's something wrong with this picture. We want peace, you know, especially in the American Jewish community. Absolutely. Tremendous So desire. do the people of Israel. Absolutely. And I think many Palestinians want it too. But they don't have a leadership that is, uh, A, legitimate, because uh, Abu Mazen's term ran out two years ago. The Palestinian National Council was dissolved. Uh, you know, he, he's not operating under a legal mandate. Nobody wants to have elections. Nobody forces elections because they're afraid of the outcome. And that with they would Hamas lose. And, well, or, or it would be a different yeah. uh, configuration. And, um, you know, we, we forced an election once in Gaza and we found out the result. You know, it's one man, one vote, one time. So the, the um, uh, you know, the, the, the question of who you're talking to and what authority do they have? Number one, is it a legitimate government? If it is a legitimate government, do they have the mandate to negotiate? If they have the mandate, are they prepared to negotiate? And if they do reach an accord, are they prepared to implement it? So far, there's no answer to those questions. Okay, so far you've mentioned Iran and the peace process right. as two of the major issues as we begin 2011. You were about to give me a third. I would say a third issue is the campaign to undermine the legitimacy of Israel. It's, glo it's a global campaign. Uh, we just held a conference in Jerusalem in which re representatives, professionals from 30 countries came together. And it's quite remarkable how similar the challenges are on the campuses amongst the intellectual elite, amongst creative classes, amongst the uh, um, populations at large in, in some countries where this hostile, distorted, and, and um, disinformed uh, position of, positioning of Israel, uh, where Israel is blamed not only for every problem in the Middle East, but every problem in the world. You know, recently the Egyptians blamed them for the shark attack, and the, the Saudis caught a vulture that had been marked, you know, with a tag to mark migration, and of course it became then a spy vulture. Or, I mean, every problem that arises, the, the flooding of the Nile, the t attack on the Coptic church, and, and everyone gets blamed on Israel somehow or the other. Uh, but in, in a more serious vein, we see that uh, the populations in, in Poles and others are reflecting a more of a hostile at attitude based on a lack of information or one-sided information. Uh, and even officials and others are, are, are jumping on the bandwagon. You have the, sometimes the boycott campaigns, uh, which have had limited success but have the danger of, of growing. And now we're seeing those man things manifested in our own country, on our campuses, the growing hostile atmosphere. We see the, the uh, campaigns of propaganda and distortion and misrepresentation. We see how many the media, our general media, become victim, uh, fall victim to this. And in, by doing that, make the American people victims because they're giving them false and wrong information. 
So I think the big challenge will be for us to mobilize resources. We've created a center here that, that we hope will bring us into the 21st century and using the media and programs like yours um, to get to the electronic media, the internet, uh, the social media, to, to be more effective in communicating our message and having uh, the voices heard of the, of the American people, not just the Jewish community, where Israel enjoys overwhelming support still but we can't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. So I would say the third major challenge will be countering this. Uh, then we have the challenges related to that at the United Nations, where you have the ongoing efforts to demonize and delegitimize Israel, the Human Rights Council's constant harping and attacking Israel and ignoring all the major human rights violations in the world. Um, and the, uh, uh, whether it's Human Rights Council, the General Assembly, the automatic resolutions, the, it is increasingly a, another battlefront for us in, in terms of sustaining Israel. And, and this is not about 67. It's not about policies. This is about 47. It's not about the territories. It's about Israel's right to exist, Israel as a country. And, you know, little islands sit in the United Nations with 60,000 people and nobody challenges their right to exist. It's only Israel mm -hmm. that today faces this. The name Neve Gordon a professor at Ben Gurion University, is associated now with a movement within Israel to also be involved in the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement against Israel. And there have been things written of late of how Israelis, more and more Israelis, are very upset with some of the far-left academic movements inside the state of Israel. And there's always a tension, Malcolm, between free speech, free expression, and something that crosses a line to sedition. Do you have any perspective at all about the extent to which we see inside the state of Israel, and then in some way inside the American Jewish community here, attempts to say that Israel is so wrong that it is appropriate that these movements to delegitimize Israel should be supported within the Jewish world? I think the voices here are very minimal. And we have done extensive studying of this. It's very minimal, uh, although they get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And then you have some organizations that purport to represent, you know, this significant uh, population when, in fact, they, uh, they do not and, and I think would be rejected by most by virtue of their activities. But America is, has not yet faced the brunt of this in the same degree that, let's say, in Europe and elsewhere it has, where, unfortunately, Jews do fall victim to these same things. And part of the problem is that we do not educate our young. We do not prepare them. We don't give them the answers. So they fall victim when they come to the campuses to some of the extremist uh, ideologies, professors, organizations, efforts, uh, and then join the anti-Israel activities. Uh, again, it's a small percentage. I would say there's a much larger percentage that is sort of disinterested, uh, also uninformed, and we have to reach them. And, and once you make Israel's case to them, once they understand at least the fundamentals, and it doesn't mean they have to agree with every policy of Israel, uh, you see that there is a major shift. In Israel, mm -hmm. there is, it is of great concern that because you have a democratic country that allows freedom of speech, which we all want to see protected, but there are people who abuse it. When professors there can talk about boycotting Israel, and they're not even talking about boycotting the settlements, which is bad enough when you have uh, those uh, performers and others who said they wouldn't perform in a cultural center because it was an Ariel, which is outrageous. Uh, and I think the answer is that those people ought to be boycotted, that, is, that anybody who would engage in that kind of activity, and it doesn't mean they have to support settlements. It's a big difference. People try to lump it together. Boycotts are by their very nature abhorrent and should be abhorrent in the democracy, that if you want to debate issues, debate them. But don't engage in these kind of activities. And moreover, these professors give legitimacy to the haters by they say, look, these Israelis are, are saying these extreme things. And it gives a, a cover then for them uh, and legitimates the, these uh, people whose goal is the elimination of, of the state of Israel. Unfortunately, in, in Israel, you have such voices. I think it's the universities have a responsibility, especially professors and their peers, to, to uh, address these, these uh, views, that there have to be some standards 
there has to be some standard that people are demanded to adhere to of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Yelling fire in a theater is not acceptable. Calling for, for actions to be taken uh, if groups that uh, support the, you know, the, some of the violent demonstrations, that is not acceptable. And the Knesset, just as we are t uh, having this discussion, just voted to investigate mm -hmm. some of the organizations because they are getting foreign money. They're getting money from sources uh, which they do not disclose, which would be unacceptable if they were to be made public, and the public, I think, has a right to know. So they, they, despite much opposition, because I think there are a lot of people who are afraid of what will come out, uh, the Knesset is calling for uh, this investigation. Uh, it is not to stymie free speech. There's a big difference between that and what these people, some of them, and it's only a handful, are engaged in. Sedition seems to me to cross the line. Absolutely. It crosses the line here in America, it would cross the line in Israel, and Israel is in a much more complicated situation because of its struggle against the Arab world. Sedition is a tough word, but, uh, but the, the principle of what you're espousing is that things that, that uh, people have a right to criticize their governments, they have a right to criticize policies, they have a right to have differences, they have a right to give expression to those differences, but there is a line you cross. And when you do things that are harmful to the state, harmful to the people, I think they have, they have, we have an obligation to hold them to account, here or there. You know, you're in a complicated situation vis-a-vis -vis now the American administration. For years and years and years, the President's Conference was recognized by Washington as the consensus voice of the formal Jewish community. And when there were issues that the administration wanted to discuss with the Jewish community, they would reach out to whomever was the chairman of the President's Conference, to the executive vice chairman, and who for now for decades has been yourself. And that, in essence, it was the people who were part of the President's Conference, the presidents of the major American Jewish organizations, who rec represented the vast amount of engaged, committed American Jews. You were the ones who had to go and confront whoever was the president or the secretary of state or the State Department itself. In 2010, or since the Obama administration, a meeting was convened in which you were not the one who decided who was at the table. And you were at the table. J Street was at the table. There were others who were not necessarily part of the president's conference who were at the table. My question for you is, at the moment, whom do you feel has a right to sit at the consensus Jewish, American Jewish community table, and does it in your mind include J Street? How do you determine, Malcolm, who from the American Jewish community should be around the table that you would convene? Forget about Washington. It's very easy. It's the members of the Conference of Presidents. J Street is not a member. We have people who represent everything from Peace Now to ZOA. We have Reform, Orthodox, Conservative. You have all the major groups. I think every viewpoint represented there. So for us, it's simple. We, we believe in the member organizations. Let me go to your fundamental point. I think every president has convened meetings where they invited, especially when it comes to a small group, and to a degree, I prefer it that way because then I don't have to exclude people and everybody thinks yes, I, I make up the list <laughs> and therefore determine so they know I did not make up the list and therefore they can't hold me to account because sometimes the president will say, I want to meet 10 people, I want to meet 40 people, I want to meet the whole president's conference, which they're entitled to do and they, you know, it depends on the nature of the discussion they want to have. Uh, so it's not a new phenomenon. Second of all, I mean, we've had this discussion with the administration. I think they do understand it, and um, we will see what, what will, how they will decide to conduct themselves in, in the future. You know, every president has a right to create the forum and the fora that they want. Each president has done it by his own rules. But that does not in any way mitigate against the role of the conference. This is the vehicle when they want to discuss issues. State Department, White House, others, they'll come to the Conference of Presidents. We meet with them very regularly, not publicly again, because the issues we discuss are not necessarily public, but we do discuss it with our members or come back and, and try to reflect the views of, uh, of the member organizations of the conference. Uh, so that relationship, I think, will, will continue. We have speakers from the administration. We have many coming in 2011 already lined up. Um, and we will have meetings in Washington. J Street, I do not think, is a pro-Israel 
or for that matter, a pro-priest organization. They can purport to be, but I think their activities have, have shown that that is not the case. You said it's not pro-peace. Well, they continue because I believe to be pro-peace, you have to be pro-Israel. You have to be supportive of things that create the atmosphere of peace, fighting the sanctions on Iran, fighting on Goldstone, fighting uh, the resolution in support of Israel's right to defend itself at Castellet. Those things, which all of which J Street did, even though they later may have reversed the position after the damage was done, um, I think they have delimited themselves. I think people have come to see. I think in a few years it won't be. It certainly won't be what it is. I think the exposures about some of the corruption and other things uh, there have, have impacted it. Um, I don't spend time on it. I don't, uh, you know, discuss it. I don't work against it. I, don't, I, I, re I think, frankly, it's marginal. Uh, I don't think its impact is that great. It gives a cover for some of those who, who have not been supportive of Israel to be able to claim legitimacy by virtue of the fact. I do think that there are people out there for whom there should be a vehicle. I don't believe that is it. Uh, I think that they have uh, forfeited that right by their behavior. I'm all for having people give expression. That's why I try to expand the membership of the conference to have every point of view within its, its uh, tent. And, uh, and an open tent doesn't mean that everybody simply has a license to be part of it. Why isn't J Street a member? If, if J Street wanted to be a member of the President's Conference as APAC, would you say okay? Well, first of all, it's not for me to say okay. It has to go to a membership committee. It needs a vote of two-thirds of the member organizations. It needs to meet certain objective criteria that any applicant has to meet. It has to be in business five years. It has to other things. I don't know if they have been. so. I'd have to see if they have a, a if they need question. to have a democratic structure. I don't know that that is the case there. Uh, but let's assume if they meet those, then what we would do is bring it before the membership committee. They make a recommendation to the full conference. Conference would have to vote. I doubt very seriously that they would get two-thirds of the members of the conference who would see them as a, as a constructive partner. Um, but it would be their decision. It would not be one that I would make. You've been way ahead on the curve in terms of warning the Jewish community and basically the Western world about the influence of Iran in Venezuela. What's your sense these days? I think we lost the battle, at least this, this battle, uh, by virtue of the fact that it is now infected, as I've discussed on your show for years and tried to warn people, as we did about Iran going back to the nuclear program in the early 90s and about Islamist fundamentalism. People don't want to try to anticipate problems. These are all issues we could have addressed early on. But now you see Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua, all of them falling into line. Even Brazil and Argentina uh, falling under, this, in, under their sway and, and becoming party to this. And the, the growing influence manifested, for instance, in Mexico where they found a Hezbollah network, where they found tunnels underneath our borders like the ones in Gaza, where we know that they're tied to the narco-terrorism and to the to the car, uh, Kali cartel and to, uh, to Lebanon, to, to drug smuggling and where the mixture of, of terrorism and, and uh, narco traffic. Um, so it's coming right up to our border. And we know that they've infiltrated our border with people through various points of entry in, in the southern uh, parts of the United States. So this is a growing danger. It's one that we really have to still give more attention to. I think we made mistakes. I think the president shaking hands with Chavez several times or uh, whatever was seen by some of the other leaders uh, in very negative terms and also because it sent a signal that perhaps, you know, they were on the wrong side, that Chavez got three handshakes and they didn't, um, you know, everybody reads everything, you know, it's, it's, the, it's like the criminologists about who stands where and who got handshakes, but everything counts. And the question of how much attention we give to South America, this is not an Israel issue. This is um, Iran saying, you know what? I can fight, fight America from two hours off its shore. I don't have to fight it from 8,000 miles away. In the meantime, Iran has moved ahead with its nuclear program. We, all the negotiations, all the talks, P5 plus one, et cetera, et cetera, what has it yielded? Nothing but buying them time. What has worked, fortunately, is the Stuxnet worm, the infiltration of their computer system, which continues to plague them. Uh, the elimination of some of the nuclear scientists, some of the work accidents, some of the explosions at their missile factory, uh, all of these uh, unfortunate incidents, um, I think have had an impact in setting it back, but it doesn't eliminate the nuclear program. So we may postpone it a while, but we have not done anything 
over all these years, talking and being manipulated and for them buying time, humiliating their Western uh, interlocutors. Uh, the sanctions, I think, are working, and I think the administration serves credit for the sanctions they've introduced, and the Europeans are doing a better job at it. It's certainly having an impact in the, in the energy and um, banking sector. In energy, they lost at least $60 billion in investments this year, in this past year, in the oil sector. They're importing more and more of their oil. Their planes can't land. The foreign minister was supposed to go to the Netherlands, but couldn't because then nobody would refuel his plane. So the sanctions are having an impact. But alone, they're not going to do it. They can, you know, it's sort of like softening the territory before uh, your next level of assault. And, and what it means is we have to continually ratchet it up. We have to continue to make them more effective. Uh, we have to look at other options. It could be you could blockade uh, Iran. We can uh, introduce uh, additional measures. And most of all, they have to believe that the threat against them is credible. And if we don't say it, and if we don't keep saying that the military option is there, uh, nobody wants to see it exercised that I know of Hussein. I mean, it is absolutely the last option. But they got to believe that it's a credible option, or else they say, so what? So, you know, they will, they'll, they'll affect us. They'll knock out a couple thousand centrifuges. We'll replace them. Well, Stuxnet was better than that. Although you did allude a moment ago to Islamic fundamentalism. At one point, that term might, might have been higher on your list. And there seems to also be at the moment a, um, an idealism about how one should speak about the Muslim world and that one should not make Muslim the enemy. So I want you to talk for me for one moment about your perspective on the issue of the threat posed by Islamic fundamentalism worldwide. Yes, I use the term Islamist to separate it from Islamic. That people, who Muslims have uh, beliefs, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. The problem is how it's translated. And the Islamists are intent on creating this extremist ideology that uh, both not only seeks hegemony in the world, but will utilize people for su as suicide bombers, sees every means as legitimate, that seeks to take over governments, that is extending its influence, that is the, like Iran, the, the core of the worldwide terrorist network. Uh, look at the violation of human rights, the, uh, the uh, execution of children in Iran. I mean, these things should send shivers down people's back. Where's all the outcry when young people in Iran get arrested, when thousands of people are arrested after an election, when the opposition is arrested, not people I necessarily like, but where are the voices of outrage? Do you know all the U Security Council and Human Rights Council resolutions? Where are they? Where is where is the church outrage of hundreds of Muslims, Baha'is, and Christians being executed? What about the, the, what's happening to the Christians in Iraq and Egypt and all the rest of the Muslim world? Where is the kind of outcry that one would anticipate with the the latest attack on the Coptic Church? Got it for for a while because it captured people. It was during Christmas, uh, New Year's, but and because uh, 21 people were killed, but. It's an ongoing problem, and it's a problem that the only country in the Middle East where the Christian population has increased is Israel, the one that they criticize the most and, and, and attack. So I, I think that there is a political correctness that has set in that inhibits the ability to talk honestly and freely about the dangers posed when Peter King got attacked for, for addressing it and saying, look, the Muslim community has a responsibility. They're the ones who should be saying it, not him, and they should be applauding him and working with him. And I hope that they will. That, uh, you know, the bulk of Muslims are not involved in this, but they get caught and tarred by the, and, uh, by the same brush by, by uh, the involvement of too many. You know, there's hardly a week when you don't have an arrest in the United States of people, Muslims, involved in terrorist activities, either laundering, financing, direct involvement, smuggling, whatever. But almost there is not a week when you don't have a case. There were 64 arrested in the last 14 months in the United States, and that's not those who were not arrested. So it is not a hypothetical issue, and it's not a racial issue. You know that a Jew in America is seven times more likely to be victim of a hate crime than a Muslim. So while Islamophobia is not acceptable and should be condemned when it appears, the fact is that a Jew is much more, anti-Semitism is far more severe than, than uh, by FBI statistics than the uh, Islamophobia. But the bottom line is that I would hope that the Muslim community would find its voice and, and that more speakers would feel free to speak more than once, because unfortunately those who have the courage and do speak up usually don't do it a second time, that, uh, that administration and others 
when they invite people to events, will help strengthen the true moderate voices in the community, and that we not be afraid to, to call things for what they are. And I don't care what community it is. I think the Jewish community has responsibilities. I think every community, Catholic Church, has a responsibility to root out the problems that it is confronting and addressing them and, and not hiding them. They did. They paid a price now, a great price for, for that, and you see them uh, addressing it. All of us have that responsibility. The moral leaders have that responsibility, clergy, others, to, to speak out. But there is an intimidation. There's a fear today of addressing and speaking honestly and openly uh, about these issues. You know, Europe didn't want to face it. Now many of them are throwing up their hands. And the result is that you have far more extreme movements growing in counter balance to the, to, the, to the problems that they would not address. Maybe if they had confronted and talked about how you integrate the populations, making greater efforts you know, to, to moderate, instead of having the younger generation there becoming more and more extreme and following extremist leaders, even if their parents were, were moderates or seculars. Look at Turkey, look at other things. Because of the ignorance of the West, because we don't understand the culture, we don't know how to confront it, we don't want to, and often we do things that dis or, or, or alienate them, as we have done to too many of the moderate leaders in, in Central Asia, making demands on them that are not possible to implement or holding them to standards that they can't meet. But on the other hand, encouraging those countries that are looking to the West, that are moving in the right direction. And too often, those are the ones we confront and not the guys who, who are really engaged in the worst activities. You and I never had a chance to talk about the Beinart piece. And there is here this idea that somehow liberalism and Zionism are no longer compatible, that somehow Israel has betrayed American Jewish liberalism. Malcolm, what was your response to it? And in general, what do you say about this issue? Well, I'd rather not talk about his piece because I think, you know, there was a, a lot of false things. Uh, it's not that there isn't an issue. There is an issue. We are concerned about where young people are at. Uh, but he, you know, he draws conclusions not based on, on facts or, or research and uh, makes assertions. He didn't bother to check it, certainly not in regard to the things he wrote about things that we know about or we were involved with as with others uh, as well. Uh, you know, we have allowed Zionism become a pejorative. How did that happen? Because it was a mistake. People didn't take it seriously. They said, well, they only meet them. We don't mean Jews. We mean Zionists. We mean those Zionists. And then you allow this creeping terminology uh, or, or, or allowing this uh, negative interpretation to creep along and creep along and expand and expand. And then all of a sudden, the Zionists, everybody said, no, no, I'm not a Zionist. Not a, what does it mean? We forgot what it means. The right of people, Jews to have self-determination, the right of people to have a country, that is what they want to deny us. They do want to take away Zionism from us. But the, the fact that we have allowed it to become such a pejorative, to become a, a negative term, and the idea that Zionism isn't liberal, look at what Zionism does. What other country can have the, has the record of Israel in bringing people in? So now Israel becomes then, because it opens its borders, it has 1,000 people uh, a month coming in from Africa, a little country, trying to absorb them, trying to put them to work, tries to, and then no matter what they do, to say, look, we're going to have a processing center in the south, we're going to try to do something. The Egyptians shoot them in the, in the, in the, in the Sinai Desert. E Israel has become this magnet for them because of economic and other reasons that they want to come there. And, you know, they said, okay, those from Darfur, those who are ref true refugees, we would accept. But all of a sudden you have this influx and there's millions and millions of people on the move. You can't possibly do it. But what country reached out? Now they're taking in 7,000 more people from Ethiopia, uh, Jews from, from Ethiopia. And if you look at, at their ability to maintain what is a liberal democracy in a sea of, of hostility and in a, a region where democracy, let alone liberal democracy, is a rarity, uh, I think that the record speaks for itself. But it was a mistake on our part. It was a mistake on the part of the community. It was a mistake on the part of the Zionist community to allow this to happen. We should be asserting it and making people walk around with badges, Jews and non-Jews. Christians don't have a problem saying, I'm a Christian Zionist. It seems Jews have more problems sometimes uh, with saying it, and I think that they've lost the meaning of the term. By the way, the reason you always hear is one word, occupation, that somehow Israeli occupation of the West Bank trumps every good thing Israel is or does. Because it became an easy scapegoat. You don't want to face the reality of how did this occupation come about? Did Israel all of a sudden go and grab this land? Or was it attacked from four sides and as a result came back into the territory? 
When you talk about the West Bank, we have to remember its status under international law. It was occupied by Jordan from 47 to 67, recognized only by England and Pakistan. No one else recognized. The, the, in fact, if there is uh, somebody who has a legal claim, it's probably the Ottoman Empire from, uh, exactly. from the last days of the pre-mandate. So, you know, we have allowed again there, you know, the term settlement has become so associated. You know, when people go and visit the, quote, settlements, they're shocked. They can't believe that they see cities built in this area where for all the area around there's no one in most of the places that were built in defined areas, mostly on government land, where there are problems. Of course there were problems. Nobody denies that there were, there were problems. But by and large, these are peaceful communities and not doing anything to anybody. These are our cities and communities. The word settlement has already become also, you know, we, we think about it on the, on the West when people build settlements. Um, that is not the case as, as those who have visited the Israel know. So the, the you know, I, I think to a large degree we don't take words seriously. We don't think about what words really mean. If we did, we'd be much more cautious about uh, the terminology and uh, the, the allowing words to be hijacked or to be completely distorted and misrepresented. Is there anything you want to say in general about now the relationship between the Obama administration and the American Jewish community and the state of Israel as we begin 2011? Well, I think the Obama administration will go through a lot of changes, personnel changes and others. Uh, I think they will reassess their approaches to the Middle East. I think that they acknowledge that mistakes were made. Um, I think that they have a constructive role to play. Um, I think that the uh, emphasis on settlement, some of the other things that were done they would acknowledge today were, were not uh, helpful. Uh, but that doesn't mitigate against the fact that the United States can play an important role, should play an important role, that the U.S. is a relationship in many respects is stronger than ever, certainly on a military level where you have joint exercises all the time. You have, uh, I think, a better relationship than even in the Bush administration. Uh, I think on the intelligence, I think in R&D, I think in scientific, in so many areas, the relationship is truly remarkable. Support amongst the American people is truly remarkable, but we shouldn't take it for granted. I think that the new Congress will be very supportive. I think that, uh, you know, you don't have any other issue that gets the broad support with Tea Party, without Tea Party, Democrats, Republicans, uh, than issues related to Israel. I think you should mention Eric Cantor and the significance of Eric Cantor as House Republican Majority Leader. Well, I think Eric uh, becoming the uh, number two guy in the Republican Party as they take control of the House is very important. I think it's an important expression about the American people towards, towards a very demonstratively Jewish uh, member coming from a non-Jewish area uh, who is respected, I think, on both sides of the aisle. He's articulate. He's uh, very presentable. He's a, a wonderful guy, a good friend. Um, I think we're all proud to, to see him in that position, but not just because he's Jewish, but because I think he's a great legislator and a, and a wonderful person. Uh, but I believe that, that, and I hope, that we will see bipartisanship, we will see an end to some of the unnecessary conflict. Part of it is always going to be, it's part of the democratic system, but in this case, uh, I really hope and I think the American people really want to see uh, the parties coming together, address the issues. Uh, we'll be getting into the presidential election Very before soon. the end of the year. Right. Uh, candidates will start announcing. And I hope that that doesn't detract or, or, or you know, create so much partisanship early on. Uh, I would much prefer much shorter campaigns with candidates you know, limited to announcing the year before even though they start campaigning already uh, many years before, the, um, because we have real challenges, economic and other challenges, that for America to remain the great power and for America to address those issues, we need to have everybody behind it. So now, as I ask you the last question. The last, last I, question. Yes, no, this is it. I, I mean, in part, I wanted to hear what you thought the problem areas were. And there's no one who does this better than you. Explain to the American community in general and the Jewish community in particular, what the issues of concern should be. No one does it like you. You're remarkable. But I don't want our audience to only think you see the negative. So I'm asking you, as we end this discussion, what are the things, as we enter 2011, that please you, 
that give you a sense of hope and pride? Well, first of all, I think that overall, there's plenty of reason to be optimistic. Uh, you know, they say the difference between an optimist and a pessimist, that the optimist says this is the best of all possible worlds and a pessimist agrees. I don't say this is the best of all possible worlds. But I, I do think that we saw in this election that Israel, support for Israel, at a time when many people said it would be heard in the Tea Parties and the changes and everything, that the fundamentals remain very strong. We have just, as I said, finished this most extensive study ever done, and the signs are very positive about where the American people are on their attitude towards Israel and towards the Jewish community. Uh, I think that the uh, points I made about the relationship between the United States and Israel, that the U.S.-Israel relationship in economic terms and so many other realms, in the military security realm. I think the fact that the world has come to understand that Iran is not an Israel issue or a Jewish issue, but everyone's issue, is a very important, uh, a very important development. Third, I think that the Jewish community and non-Jews are finally coming to terms with the need to confront this delegitimization effort. And I believe in 2011, we really will make a difference. I have every indication and reason to believe that you will see here and around the world much more aggressive, broad-based efforts involving everything from church groups and unions and grassroots groups, Jewish and non-Jewish, that we will improve our capacity to respond, that we will improve our ability to get information out quickly, accurately, that that will enable us to, to have that capacity to, uh, to get the truth out, which is all we want. Let people judge Israel and let people judge the issues based upon facts, good and bad. I think on the whole, we'll come out great and it will be a really good year. And Israel itself doing well? Israel has uh, a lot of internal challenges, but look, they had the biggest gas discovery yes. imaginable, <laughs> the second one in a year, which will make it, could make it independent for the next hundred years. Certainly that's an amazing development. The, Growth, economic growth continues. Uh, they were not hurt as other countries were by their advanced planning. I think there's still some political instability that this coming year may be manifest, but uh, hopefully they'll be able to, to resolve that. Um, and uh, I'm still hopeful that uh, they can make progress on the, on the prospects for peace. It is wonderful that you give us so much time. My pleasure. I'll say it again, no one is able to analyze in as concise and clear and as detailed a way all at the same time. You do extraordinary work for the Jewish world and the Jewish community here in America and in Israel. I wish you kol tuv You look wonderful. I hope this is in your health. It's the lighting. <laughs> no, you look terrific. You look strong, healthy, and I expect you to be able to do wonderful, wonderful things for all of us, and we get to talk Thank often. You. Thank I you. Welcome. You're I appreciate welcome. Thank it very, you. very much. Thank you for this show. It's really an important vehicle to educate the people. Thank you. And those were the thoughts of Malcolm Honline, Executive Vice Chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. We hope you enjoyed hearing him. As always, I invite you to be in touch with us with any thoughts or comments to the ideas expressed by Malcolm. Please be in touch with me by email or by mail or by posting on our Facebook homepage. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD, and we thank you for your kind support.